Let's bow for a word of prayer together. A loving Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come into your presence once again and to worship thy name, to exalt your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that we are able to gather in the name of him who died on that cross for us. And Father, we pray that you would be pleased as we study your word and you might speak to our hearts and we might be challenged to change for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If you will take your Bibles with me this morning, let's turn to a psalm. We're looking at a particular psalm, 115. Turn to Psalm 115. As you are turning there, a little background about this psalm. Uh, we don't know when it was written. We don't know who wrote it. It's not ascribed to anybody in particular, but many scholars believe that this psalm was written during the exile out of Babylon uh, when the Jews came back to rebuild the temple. And then, of course, there were pagans in the land that mocked them and persecuted them as they came back to try and rebuild. And uh, so this was a psalm that uh, they believed may have been written around that time. Now, Psalms 113 through 118 are a collection of songs that are called the Egyptian Hallel Collection. Egyptian Hallel, H-A-L-L-E-L. And of course, that, that name Hallel in Hebrew means praise. That is where we get, of course, our, the name Hallelujah. But these particular songs were sung by the Jews during particular feasts. They sang them during the course of the Passover, the Tabernacle Feast, Feast of Tabernacles, and the Dedication Feast. In fact, what's amazing is that we, be, we believe that Psalm 115 was sung by Jesus and His disciples at the Last Supper. This particular psalm is one that is used during the Passover feast, particularly at the end of the feast. And we read in Mark 14, 26, And after singing a hymn, they, Jesus and the disciples, went out to the Mount of Olives. So this psalm was sung by Jesus and the disciples. Now I titled the message here, The Glory Road. The Glory Road. Now, when I say that phrase, what comes to your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the glory road? Well, what comes to my mind first would be the road to heaven, right? Uh, there are many songs about heaven and we're going to glory and uh, we're on the road to glory. In fact, there was an old gospel hymn called Glory Road. Let me read you some of the lyrics of this beautiful hymn. Dark, deserted, or dim? Is there hope for tomorrow? Put your trust in Him. How appropriate for today. On this glory road I'm traveling. Many times I stumbled on my way. But praise the Lord. I'll soon be leaving to that land of perfect peace and endless day. I can see the lights of home. I can see Him on His throne. And I'm too near to turn back now. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm heaven bound. When my journey here shall end, I'll say goodbye to this world of friends. In that fair land, I'll take my stand. It's good to be on this road for glory land. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, I trust that's an encouragement to you. Is Yes, we are on the road to glory. And we are going through many deep valleys and trials and, and heartache on that road. But also, if you take that phrase, the glory road, you will find if you, you do some research on it, there was actually a movie made in 2006 titled Glory Road. And it's, a, it's based on a true story 
1965, the coach of the high school girls basketball team, Don Haskins, was invited by the Texas Western Miners to be their coach. Now, despite the lack of budget, Haskins sees the chance to dispute the NCAA and moves with his wife and children to the college dormitory. He recruits seven talented and rejected black players to play with five Caucasian players. And they formed a legendary team that actually won the 1966 national championship against powerful Kentucky. I don't know how many of you knew that story, but it's quite remarkable. But they were on the glory road to a championship. Of course, if we flip the words around, we can say it in another way, the road to glory, the road to glory. And this is used many times in our sports activities, in the sports arena and uh, the business world. It's, it's used of telling of one's journey to the pinnacle of success as, and, of course, as well as uh, re- reaching heaven for the believer. But here in Psalm 115, the psalmist is going to speak about glory. And look at verse 1 with me, if you would. Psalm 115, verse 1. He begins by saying, Not to us, O Lord... Not to us, but to thy name give glory because of thy loving kindness, because of thy truth. Here the psalmist wants, and remember the psalmist here is praying to the Lord. So this song is a song of praise to the Lord. And here he speaks of this glory road, but not a physical one or reaching a pinnacle of success on an earthly plane, but our spiritual journey. He wants us to know that we should not be placing the, our glory, or glory we receive on ourselves, but to give it to God. The glory belongs to Him. Notice what the psalmist says. He says, not to us, O Lord, not to us. He says it twice. He repeats it. In other words, he's saying, Lord, there's no way. We do not want the glory. We do not want the glory. But you deserve all the glory. In Isaiah 42, 8, the Lord says, I am the Lord. That is my name. And I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. In Isaiah 48, 11, the Lord repeats, For my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. See, God is is jealous for His glory. And we're going to find how important it is for we as believers to day in and day out, as part of our daily life, seek to give Him the glory in all we do, in all we say, and all we accomplish. Now the word glory here, this English word glory here, has 20 different variations of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek in the, uh, in the Scriptures. So, but it's translated one word glory in all our English Bibles. But 20 different variations. So depending on the context, uh, you have to look at the context to see what this word glory means. And most of them, if you, where you find it in Scripture, most of the time the word glory is associated with ascribing splendor or majesty to God. But it can also refer to glory in something, something else. Now, I think this is important that before we go on here to understand something about that word glory. There are two types of glory. There is intrinsic glory and ascribed glory. And let me explain the difference here. 
I like the definitions of the two, these two types of glory written by Stan Attic. Stan Attic. Let me read them to you. First, there is intrinsic glory. Intrinsic glory is the sum of, and the substance of all of his divine perfections and all of his attributes, God's attributes. It is the fullness of his eternal being. We cannot add or take away from his glory. He is the God who was and who is and who shall ever be. He is immutably the same from age to age. His glory is the sum of his holiness, his transcendence, his independence, his autonomy, his sovereignty, his omnipotence, his righteousness, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his love, his mercy, his grace. All the attributes of God comprise his intrinsic glory. It's who God is. Webster Dictionary defines glory as inward, internal, true or genuine or real, not by accident. So that is intrinsic glory. God, who He is, He has that glory from all of eternity, all His attributes. But then there's ascribed glory. Ascribed glory is what we give to God, which is to render to Him the praise and worship that belong to Him and Him alone. The more we understand His intrinsic glory, the more we will ascribe to Him glory. And we see Peter wrote about it, 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace in, in, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory, both now and forevermore. So here in the first verse of Psalm 115, the psalmist sings to the Lord that the ascribed glory should never be ascribed to us, but to Him alone. Now let's look at the rest of verse 1. He says, But to Thy name give glory, because of thy loving kindness, because of thy truth. The NIV translates it, because of your love and faithfulness. If you have a King James Version, it's translated, because of thy mercy and thy truth's sake. But now the psalmist is mentioning two attributes of the character of God, which are part of his intrinsic glory, which we just shared his loving kindness or mercy and his truth where do we see his loving kindness and mercy at the cross where jesus christ gave his life he came from heaven to earth and died there for our sins and thereby saving us while we were yet sinners christ died for us so there is god's loving kindness and then that loving kindness goes on once we're saved he blesses us with bountiful blessings. And then there is the truth. He is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And of course, His truth is the Word of God. So we should ascribe all glory and praise to God because of His intrinsic glory, who He is, which includes loving kindness and truth. I have to ask myself, do I meditate upon these attributes of God? Do I thank Him every day and praise Him for His loving kindness, His mercy? Do I praise Him and thank Him for His truth, the truth that He has revealed to me in bringing me to salvation and giving me understanding through His Holy Spirit to understand what is written in these pages? But let's look at for now verses 2 and 3. The psalmist now goes on, says, Why should the nations say, Where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. And He does whatever He pleases. You catch that? This verse 3 is a powerful verse. It 
it lays it out so simple. The psalmist lays it out as to the sovereignty of God and how he is in control. But first, the question that the nations ask, where's your God? And they do it today. You as a Christian, people are looking at your life and they're watching you and they're seeing how you're handling this crisis. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you got sick with a virus or other situations happened through all this. And people are watching. And you claim to be a Christian. You claim to have your faith in Jesus Christ. And the mockers will come and they will say, where is God in all this? Where is He? The virus is out of control and God is is not to be found. How sad. But that is the way the world looks at God. I want you to turn to Psalm 42. Let's go back to Psalm 42, verse 10. Psalm 42, 10. The psalmist here mentions the heathen asking that same question again. Verse 10, Psalm 42, verse 10. As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? That's what they're saying today. Where's your God? Why does He come and save you? Verse 11. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Maybe you're that way today. You find yourself in despair. We have to ask ourselves, why am I living in such fear and despair? And then the end of verse 11. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him. The help of my countenance and my God. Do you see the psalmist here says, when the people are asking, where's your God? Oh, the trouble may still be all around. God has not intervened. But my hope is still in the Lord. My hope is in Him, in whom I will trust completely. So, don't be afraid when people ask that question, where is your God? But if you go back now with me to Psalm 115, and then verse 3, he says, but our God is in the heavens. He answers that question, where is your God? You want to know where God is? He says, God is in heaven. Our God is in the heavens. In other words, you can't see Him, but He's here. He's in control. Look look what He says at the end of verse 3. I love this. He does whatever He pleases. He does whatever He pleases. If I can get this one truth grounded and rooted in my heart and my mind, I will begin to experience the peace that passes all understanding. I will begin to learn contentment that the Apostle Paul learned. But it starts here, when I believe that God can do whatever He pleases. And we do not know the mind of God or what He has planned. You know, there are many verses that speak of the sovereignty of God. Psalm 103.19 proclaims, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His sovereignty rules over all. Remember Nebuchadnezzar when God had humbled him? Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel 4, but he, according, uh, speaking of, of uh, the God of Israel, he does according to His will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? And that's what many times we will ask. Lord, what are you doing? What have you done? Why have you allowed this virus? Job declared after his suffering, he said, I know that you can do all things, Lord. 
and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. This virus, this coronavirus is not bigger than God. And sadly, people have made it bigger than God. And, you know, many of us act like this virus just escaped God. Like it got loose and God goes, oh, where'd it go? I lost it. And somehow we think that God's lost control of it. Or he has no control. He doesn't know how to... to because nothing... He, it's, it's still here. How sad. And we, feel, we think that God got caught off guard because of this virus. But God is in control of this virus as well as everything else in this world. As well as every sickness and disease. God is watching over it. We live in a sin-cursed world. <clears throat> and we live under that curse until Jesus returns to restore heaven the, and earth. And he is going to remove the curse one day. But until then, there's going to be sickness, death, and suffering. But yet, I want us to understand this morning that God is sovereign and he has a purpose for each and everything that happens in our life and in this world. Whether good or bad. I want you to see what Jesus said concerning this. John 9. Let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 1. We come to the story of the blind man. Blind man who was blind from birth. Let's read together. John, chapter 9, beginning verse 1. And as he, Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? You see, it was always assumed that if there was sickness that came upon someone or their, their family or uh, some disaster, that they did something wrong. Of course, we know that's not true because of the story of Job. But here they're, they're, they're saying to Jesus, well, who, who, who did the sin here that this man would, would be blind from birth? Look at Jesus' answer, verse 3. Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of Him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But there in verse 3, Jesus said, This man is blind from birth not because of any sin that he committed or his parents. But he says, This man is blind in order that the works of God may be displayed in him. And of course, Jesus restores his sight. My dear friends, this virus is not out of control. God is in control. God is sovereign. And He has a purpose to use everything for good. Yes, this virus. So that His glory might be displayed and His marvelous works. What are some of those things that have happened? Well, through this, we are seeing many people come to Jesus Christ. The gospel has spread in an even greater way because of this. People are searching for answers, searching answers to life. The virus happened so that the works of God might be displayed in the unsaved and also in us. Turn to Colossians chapter 1, if you would. Just go over to Colossians Chapter 1, let's pick it up at verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. Paul writes to the church at Colossae, And he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created by Him, Jesus. Speaking of Jesus here, all things have been created by Him. In other words, the, God the Father said, Son, I want you to do some creating. And so God gave it over to His Son to create the world, the heavens and the earth. 
All things have been created by him and for him, for Jesus. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things hold together. In other words, Jesus Christ is holding this universe together. No matter what is going on, no matter how out of control something may seem in your life, Jesus is holding all things together. And for you as a believer, you need not fear. But put your hope in the Lord and glorify His name. My friends, the psalmist said it correctly. He does whatever He pleases. And if I believe that, then I can rest in Him. Because I know I'm His child. And he will do what is good concerning me. So let's turn back to Psalm 115 here. And let's look together now. We'll read verses 4 to 8. Verses 4 to 8. Now, he's going to talk about the heathens again. And their worship of idols. Verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of man's hands. They have mouths. But they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. And those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. How sad. Here's the blindness of man. And this is where we all were before we came to Christ, we who are believers. We were blinded. We were worshiping our idols. But then we came to Christ and found salvation in Him. But now the psalmist is speaking of the people's idolatry and their idols. Hosea 8.6 sums up this argument. He says, a craftsman made it, speaking of an idol. So it is not God. But here the psalmist goes right down the line and basically says these man-made things, they worship them, but they can't do anything. They're made by man, but they can't speak, they can't hear, they can't walk. What comes to your mind? What Bible story comes to your mind when you think of, of uh, gods that can't do anything and are, are challenged? Uh, of course, we think of uh, Elijah and uh, how the, he stood there with the, the false prophets of Baal. And uh, they remember those pr- false prophets of Baal, they called on their God to send down fire from heaven and they cut themselves and they were screaming and everything else. Nothing happened. Of course not. But then you remember the story, God sent down fire, the God of Israel. And devoured them. This is the God that we worship. We worship the true and living God that has everything under control. And sadly, we all have to battle with idols in our life. We as Christians, how easy it is for me to allow something in my life or someone to become bigger than God. To become that thing where I put all my focus upon and all the glory that the glory ends up on my money the glory may end be what i've accumulated in wealth it may be a job it may even be a person and we exalt them above the lord and when i totally am cons- consumed by something other than god then that thing becomes an idol in my life. And we're all guilty of it. We've all been guilty of that. And oh, how we've got to be careful. You know, our, our, the, the idol can be the want of pleasure. It can be my body. You know, I want to be atlas. Or I, I consume myself with, with my body. I don't want to age. How about that one, you know? There are people who are so consumed with getting older, that they've got to do everything they can, and they, 
they pour themselves into trying to stay younger and stop the aging process. Sometimes we're humbled by this, aren't we? Just the other day, uh, our daughter Glory, 10 years old, had, uh, was, had a friend over and uh, she was uh, talking and, and I happened to come in the room and there um, uh, this girl, her friend Olivia, who's nine years old, uh, asked me how old I was. I said, well, I'm 64. And then she says, well, well how old is Mrs. Griner, my wife? I said, well, she's actually seven years younger than I am. Yeah, she's, I'm in my 60s, she's in her 50s. And Olivia then exclaimed, well, you are out of her league. You, you know, you're, you're out of your league when you married her. She's way too young for you. Well, I pretty, I pretty much had to agree with her. I said, yeah, you are right. She is out of my league. And yes, my wonderful wife is out of my league. I am so blessed that God would, would bring her into my life and we'd have this, these many years together. But uh, yeah, I was humbled that, that moment. But oh, how easy it is to exalt ourselves or something else and push God aside. Now, if you'll go back with me here, let's read verses 9 to 18 of Psalm 115. Pick it up at verse 9. O Israel, now he gives the remedy of what to do. How to glorify God. How to give God the glory should be ascribed to him. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and He is their shield. Who will fear the Lord? Trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Notice how many times he repeats this. The Psalms repeats this. He's saying, the Lord is the one who is our helper and our shield. Verse 12. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord. The small together with the great. May the Lord give you increase. You and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord. Maker of heaven and earth. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord. And the earth he has given to the sons of men. Then verse 17, he says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But as for us, we will bless the Lord. From this time forth and forever. And he concludes his psalm with three words. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In spite of all that's happening in your life, just as the psalmist is reminding us that we have a sovereign God who's in total control. He deserves all our glory. We need to give Him the glory, the praise that He, he deserves because of who He is. And we must glorify Him in our lives by what we do, what we put first, what our priorities are, and what comes out of our mouth. Does praise come out of my lips in a time of crisis? Do I truly believe that God is my helper? The psalmist encourages the nation of Israel here to trust in the Lord. So how do I glorify God right now in the midst of the storm of my life? Trust in the Lord. And only when we believe that He is sovereign, and I believe on all, in all the uh, uh, intrinsic uh, glory uh, uh, attributes of God, and I believe 
everything that this word says about him, only then will I be able to really attribute him the glory he deserves that will come straight from my heart. And only then will I find myself able to trust him. How do you put trust in someone that you have doubts about? You know, we can pray and say, oh, Lord, I believe you can do this. I commit this to you. And then we leave and, and we, we finish our prayer. We go out. We act like he never heard. We act like he's not there. We act like he doesn't have control of the situation. Oh, what a God we serve. And what a Savior we have. You see, the end result of seeking to give God the glory will be blessing. That's what he talks about here. He says, the Lord has been mindful, verse 12, of us. He will bless us, the house of Israel. Bless the house of Aaron. And then we're included in verse 13. You can add the church here in verse 13. He will bless those who fear the Lord. Now, his blessings come in different ways. It doesn't mean that you are going to be free of all sickness and disease or, or uh, you're going to become wealthy and uh, God is going to bless you with all kinds of prosperity. No, those blessings of God come in many ways. Our ultimate blessing will be in heaven, but here on earth, He blesses us with His presence, with His peace, with strength, with His grace to go through the storm, to accept what we can't control. And to believe that he is watching over me. As he watches over even a little sparrow that falls. He sees me. And he will meet all my needs. Yes, God will bless us, dear Christian. If we will seek to give God all the glory. And then let us continue to praise the Lord. See what that will do to your heart. Let's bow in prayer. As we close in prayer here this morning, dear Christian, perhaps your heart has been full of anxiety, fear, and doubts, but He wants to take those away. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And He will take away your fear right now if you put your trust in Him completely. Trust in the glory of God. His intrinsic glory. And believe that He loves you and He's caring for you and He will take care of you and your needs and your family. He will not forsake you. He will never leave you. That's His promise. So Christian, right now, would you just cast all your care upon Him? Just leave it in his hands. Let go. Say, Lord, I'm giving you my fears, my doubts. And Father, I'm putting my faith and trust in you. You are my shield. You are my helper. And I know that you will bless me and my family as I place my faith completely in you. Would you do that, Christian, right now? And if you have not been seeking to give God the glory in your life and other things have, you have put above Him, would you right now say, Lord, forgive me for the idols in my life. Father, I, I turn from those and I want you to be first, have preeminence in my life for you to be number one again. And show to me, Lord, if there's anything in my life that is displeasing to you that I've allowed myself to worship do that now Christian if you're here without Christ you're listening to this message my friend God showed his mercy and loving kindness and grace to you when he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins would you right now place your faith and trust in him to save you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ thou shalt be saved Jesus took your sin upon himself his blood was shed so that you could be forgiven of your sins. His blood cleanses you from all sin. 
He took the punishment for your sin. If you just believe on Him now and accept Him by faith, He will save you. If you're ready to make that decision, pray with me now. You're ready to trust Christ with your soul. You're ready to turn your life over to Him. Pray with me now. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I believe you died on that cross for me. You took the punishment for my sin. Come into my heart right now. Wash my sins away. I receive you today as my very own Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the dead. Lord Lord Jesus. And with head still bowed, my dear friend, if you gave your heart to Christ, you have now been saved. You've been born again spiritually. Born into the family of God. Seek out a good Bible-believing church if you're not part of one. Begin to grow in Christ. And find out now what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ now that you belong to Him. Father, I thank You, Lord, for Your precious Word. I thank You for decisions that may have been made But Father, I pray that we might seek to give you all the glory in our life and not take credit for ourselves. But Lord, we know that all things have come from you. May you be glorified and honored and worshipped until Jesus comes again. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.